Northland gardeners are ready for spring, and while we anxiously await its arrival, we have some inspiration for your garden planning. A look at some lovely spring and late summer blooms. We'll talk about what's new to try this season and get answers from the pros right here on this spring special edition of Great Gardening. Every tree has a moment when it shines. That's called money wart or creeping jenny. You can go in and do a rejuvenating pruning. Forage and feed for our native pollinator population. A garden really gives you peace of mind. Hello and welcome to Great Gardening, I'm Pamela Fish. Yes, it is time to think about those gardens, despite the snow across much of our region. Our experts have been pondering the subject for uh, quite some time. They are Tom Casper, garden professional and educator and horticulturist Bob Olin. Do you guys realize that you've been uh, here for 16 years helping viewers get it figured out in the garden? I haven't, <coughs> I haven't left the building in 16 years. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just staying. That's I a, love this place. Tom, that is a scary number, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you've done it a bit, though. <laughs> that's, that's absolutely true. And you guys have really helped people out. We can't thank you enough for your generosity, for, you know, all your dedication in coming here. We really appreciate it. Also with us tonight, our phone volunteers from the St. Louis County Master Gardeners who are here to answer the phones when you call in those garden questions that you've been hanging on to all winter. You can call the numbers on your screen. We have a local number, we have a toll-free number, and if you'd like to make a pledge of support to this public television station, they can help you with that too. This is our annual member drive, as you guys know, and we have our garden bus tours that we're offering to those who donate. We have a tour in May to Spring Gardens across Bayfield and Madeline Island, and then the summer tour of Twin Ports Gardens in July. So please consider coming along with us on one or both of those. We always have a really fun day and see so many amazing gardens and landscapes. And uh, you guys are so great to come along, and I know you've had fun as well, and also help provide some of the gardens that we're able to show people. Right, yeah, it's certainly a wonderful day for folks if they're thinking about if they've been watching all week mm -hmm. and now is the time that they want to donate to PBS, getting something like the tickets for these bus tours is just an outstanding perk besides being a supporter of PBS. So. It makes a really nice gift, you know, Tom, and uh, we always have full buses. We do, we do. So if you want to get in, get in early, right? <laughs> that's right, that's right. It's going to be fun. <coughs> okay, well, to start with tonight, for a program, we want to look back at how the winter weather may have uh, impacted our upcoming growing season and it was it was an interesting one wasn't it Bob? Well it was and if people remember it was last week in October when we had the first major snowfall wow. which we've been teased the previous two years with very warm Novembers we melted that off mm -hmm. unfortunately we like snow early that stays because then once we melted it got some cold weather we had quite a bit of frost penetration which we still have today unfortunately so that can be good and it can be rather bad the, the downside is we could have significant perennial damage because th that frost penetration was deep and early and then um, another downfall is perhaps we've got frozen ground we won't get quite as much moisture being picked up in the soil in okay. the spring. Not as much saturation. Not, but the real good side is we're going to kill some of the nasty insect Ooh. pests that overwinter typically in the soil. Okay. Foremost would be the Colorado potato beetle and other beetles which uh, spend the pupa or larval phase in the ground. So some of those should meet their demise. Isn't They're that a sad <coughs> thing, Tom? Yes, uh, <laughs> that's, that's the good news in that that's weather forecast. The good news, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, we also have projections for 2018. Let's take a look at those. Now here we go. Now this is the good news. Spring's supposed to be average temperatures with plenty of moisture for planting. Then we move into the summer months and average is average. And let me tell you, last year was not average with all that moisture that we had that created some difficulties. But we're average temperature, average moisture, and in the fall, above average temperatures and average rainfall. So we're going to be ripening all those late fall crops of squash and pumpkins and tomatoes. So that is a nearly perfect growing season coming up courtesy of NOAA's Climate Prediction Center. Oh, is that where it comes from? Where okay. they're never wrong, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll find out. And, and I thought those at, are your predictions. 
They're the same. They're about um, the same. We're uh, about equally right yeah, there, yeah. Pretty sure. <laughs> and, and certainly folks that are maybe watching this show for the first time and or people that are just thinking about getting into gardening, a weather forecast like that that is talking about above average uh, temperatures and, and average moisture is really, for those of us that garden, really encouraging because it we is. do need those warm days mm -hmm. and we do need that moisture. So looking at a forecast like that, it's uh, you know it's a good time to And a warm start. fall should make uh, for a great harvest. Yeah. 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 Makes us <laughs> want to get the snow shovels out and get started That's early. Right. Right. <laughs> well, maybe not that early. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, now we want to take a look at conditions from today. And we have something that we call signs of the season. And unfortunately, still looks like that. Lots of ice on the lake. This is from uh, photographer Ted Pellman, who went out to shoot just this afternoon and found that there uh, wasn't an opportunity for a picnic there. Those picnic tables were covered with snow. But the puppies are having a good time out in it. <laughs> and they're dressed for it. They are. They are indeed. <laughs> Guess what, guys? We already have some viewer questions coming in. Okay. So let's get started with those. Um, this is a call from Duluth, and I don't know who it's from, but they have a maple and a popple, and they want to know how to remove the tree before it falls, if it's dying, and uh, what the signs are of a sick tree. Lots of issues there, and mm -hmm. it, a lot of that depends on where the trees are located, of course, okay. and, and uh, they want to look at the overall health of the tree as it begins to bud and emerge. And so much decline, uh, both on popple, and I'm assuming that's probably aspen, as well as um, maple, will typically start at the top. So we get die back at the top of the tree. So that's the first place where you want to take a look and then see the way it progresses and make an assessment. Uh, this might be a situation, particularly if there's overhead lines, there's buildings and there's structures where you really want to call in a, a professional for an assessment early. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and, and certainly, uh, as Bob said, calling in a professional, it's very dangerous taking trees down yeah. of any size and really mm -hmm. relying on one of one of our local experts, and we have some really good, good arborists and tree people in town to rely mm -hmm. on for that. So Absolutely. Better safe than sorry. Exactly. Okay, um, does elephant garlic grow in our zone? Oh, it sure does. Does it? But it's a little bit of a misnomer. Uh, it's really not a true garlic, mm. but it's in the family. Mm -hmm. It's one of the allium, which is this big group. It will grow, has a little bit different flavor, but it's something and gives you the very large bulbs, so it's something that you might want to try, but uh, don't expect typical uh, garlic flavor. It's a little bit different. It is, huh? Okay. But right. it'll definitely grow, and, and of course, this whole group, we really like to get them planted in the fall so they take off a little bit early in the spring, but uh, mm -hmm. something that'll do well in, in this area, for sure. Tom, did you get a lot of garlic in last fall? Um, Jan got a lot planted. <laughs> <laughs> and so when do we um, see the scapes generally? Uh, generally mid-June to late June. Oh, is it that late? Uh, okay. Maybe okay. right in that area, depending on the season okay. and where you are located, but you know, maybe a little earlier. So. And maybe just to explain for people what a, what a gar uh, garlic scape is. Well, it's actually, it's it's part of the plant and people will harvest that and, and enjoy it. It's, it's our flo the flower stalks on them um, and very tender and edible as well. So folks will uh, use that in, in cooking and, and meal preparation. Just so. cut them right off and then the garlic bulbs stay in the ground for a while. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay. If I might add, because I was always intrigued, they always recommend that you cut those scapes off, as Tom said. And these are just the hardneck varieties that form the scapes. But, um, the word was the balls won't set up and form. Well, I did a little bit of work on that. Some I cut and some I didn't, and uh, it's very true. The earlier you cut those scapes off, the larger your bulbs are going to be. So really? as Tom says, they're going to form early. And garlic, we typically plant about mid-October, harvest about mid-August. So somewhere in between, in the end of June or so, these scapes are going to emerge. And get out there with the kitchen shears and just cut them off and then cut them again because you missed half of them the first time as well. Mm -hmm. And stir fry them <laughs> with stir, your yeah. favorite ingredients. Yeah. They are considered a delicacy. <laughs> yeah, they and, are. Uh, okay. 10, 20, 30 dollars a pound, right, Tom? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, Ken from Duluth says he's seen ground cherries at the farmer's market and is wondering if they can be purchased locally. Anybody know that? 
You, does ground. he mean for plants? They can be yes, they can be purchased yeah. uh, locally. I know a greenhouse that sells I them. Oh, do, do we? <laughs> let's, let's go ahead and help you with the name of them. Uh, Bending Birch is uh, the greenhouse that uh, my son and I are own and that Jan runs uh -huh. um, and does a great job at. Uh, and tell um, us where it is. It's up in Lakewood on okay. Cant Road. All and right. we do have ground cherries. So, so uh, what kind of uh, special care for those? Are they're pretty hardy. They're pretty, pretty tough. Much, yeah. yeah, they okay. uh, they go crazy and and certainly fun to grow and excellent. Something different if folks are looking for something. Are they sour? Unique. I feel like I should know. Yeah, this, they're pretty tart. They are a little tart. Yeah. Okay, best for um, jams and jellies. And pie. People will make pies out of them and things like that. Okay. So, yeah. All right. We're going to move on and get to more questions later. Um, to whet your appetite for colorful blossoms, we'll see very soon. Here's a look at the azaleas in bloom at Anger Park in Duluth last spring. Tom, these are gorgeous, and yeah. I know uh, you've seen them there a lot and helped take care of them yeah. over the years. Yeah, that's Rosie Lights Azalea, one of the first one uh, that came out in that Northern Light series. Uh, really beautiful blooms, uh, just outstanding color. Early in the season, um, so probably maybe early June to mid, uh, late May, depending on the kind of season that we have leading up. That's Mollus, which is a beautiful, almost tangerine oh, orange. I love that one. Yeah, just outstanding. You can also get a Mandarin Lights, uh, and that's the uh, White Lights Azalea, which is also very pretty, so mm -hmm. nice little pictures. little pink in that as yep. well, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. How long have they been growing them up at Anger Park? Uh, they've been there at least 20 years. So folks can uh, see that over time, a lot of these azaleas that we're planting and people are getting in the market may come and just be a tiny little plant. But over the course of 10, 15, 20 years, they really get rather large uh, and interesting uh, shapes to them too. So. Okay. Tom, would you cool. say that really changed the, the nature of our spring landscape? Because they were southern plant and they were mm. crossed with the mollusks, which is one of the hardy natural uh, azaleas there and uh, it really has changed things so we are owe a debt of gratitude to the breeders that did the original work on the, yeah. the light sears. All right well more great pictures of spring and summer flowers come to us from you. We encourage gardeners from across the Northland to share photos of what they've grown at home. Here's a look at some of those. Once again, Johnny was the first to jump up last spring in the gardens of Janet Eicholtz in Britt, Minnesota. Janet says she's on board to help save the rusty patched bumblebee, so most of her pictures include bees, beginning with this chestnut crab apple that she says hums loudly while in bloom. The bees also love the fern leaf bleeding heart, a favorite of Janet's all season long. The Virginia comes next and grows in good company among her peonies. Janet's foxgloves stretched to more than six feet tall last year. The coneflowers were alive with butterflies, moths, and bees of all sorts throughout the season. And summer saw honeybees feasting on the sunflowers. Here's Janet's granddaughter, Apri, posing happily as a birthday bee when she turned nine last July. If you have photos of plants, flowers, birds, or bees, send them to us so we can show what you grow. Go to greatgardening at wdse.org or mail to the address shown on your screen. Yes, please continue to share pictures of your successes from last season. We know there were a lot of them. You can go on our website or email us the pictures. We love seeing them. Um, coming up later on this special edition of Great Gardening, we'll have a primer on seed starting, something uh, we can do now while we're waiting for the snow to melt, right? right? And also a look at tamaracks in unique and interesting forms and colors. But first, an enticing garden tour. Late last summer, we visited a stunning home and garden on the south shore of Lake Superior, where the owners started with a nearly blank slate and created enchanting arrangements with incredible views. Welcome to our garden. We're so thrilled for you to be here. My name is Pam Smiley and this is my husband, John. And we're in Washburn, Wisconsin, on the banks of Lake Superior. Originally, this was part of an orchard. There was an apple orchard here. We built the stairs down to the lake shore. And so I wanted to create a vision of 
I want to go there um, inviting, stepping out of the cottage and being drawn. That's where the idea began, just inviting people to share the lake. The first time I saw a hibiscus, I love this, the organization of the petals because it's like a fan going all the way around. I saw these at the greenhouse in winter and um, bought some thinking, we'll see, and was immediately hooked. And they, not only did they grow, they bloomed, but they thrive. This is only the fourth year I've had them. Um, I'm guessing I have about 30. So I took six plants and I sawed them in half and um, planted them up there. And that's my incubator area up there. And they all came up in the spring. And the other thing about hibiscus, some of them have that burgundy leaf. Mm. This is new this year. There's hibiscus here, here, and then in the front, just a intent mauve or plum. Basically the colors are all in the pink family and red. And um, this is my favorite. I just, I think she's so pretty. This is a corkscrew larch or other, otherwise known as tamarack. And I have a, an obsession with tamaracks because I call them a pine tree with a sense of humor because they lose their needles every fall. They turn color, they're brilliant golden. And I just think it's cute. It's got an attitude. I got the weeping larches that are, I like them heading up entries because they look so gracious. It's like they're bending and greeting. They're bowing down. Yes. So when we built the new home, the elevation was probably about three feet higher than this home and we needed to make a transition. And uh, so we transitioned and then uh, put this bed in here of, of rock so that when the water does come, a lot of it evaporates off the rock uh, before it would, you know, start. And then, and then we have just kind of a natural uh, flow here that just has a slow so that the water isn't running. And so we transitioned with this rock here. It's, it's uh, pink granite, pink and black granite from Highbridge, Wisconsin probably have brought in 60, 70 tons of that. So I'm experimenting with different ground covers and it is the key. When you've got a lot of gardens to um, try to maintain the weeds, English gardening, that's probably what I'd call my inspiration, English. Welcome back. Thanks for sticking with us. We have a lot more to talk about. Oh, Tom's going to jump right in. Fun hearing all those phone calls. I know, calls. the phones Look are ringing. That's great. That We're getting a lot of questions and, and tons of support. Yeah. We just can't thank you guys enough. Um, and you know, Pam, we both have to say, because we've been with you for a while, and yeah. we really believe in public education. And when you look at all the other options out there, in this free society, people have to support the good stuff to bring the yeah. good stuff and keep the good people on the air. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. So we, we thank, We're not going thank you for this video. Well, he's been here 16 years. He'll be around here for another 36 years. Another 16 or so? <laughs> all right. All right. Well, I wanted to ask you guys, too, how you liked the tour of the Washburn Garden that we saw um, before the break. Loved it. Those Pan hyacinth, John. incredible. Uh, the hibiscus? I, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. That's the hibiscus. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for correcting me. You rarely, rarely do I get to do that. And they were, <laughs> they were the color of your shirt. Yes. And they were on our tour. And if you'll note, on our spring tour, we always have the best weather. Mm -hmm. We do. <laughs> oh, the spring. Oh, the spring tour. No, the summer well, we tour. Saw, we we do. saw the footage there. It yeah. was beautiful. It was it? beautiful. But when we were there, yeah, earlier <laughs> in the season, it wasn't so great. But it was um, still outstanding. Right. The hibiscus, though. Um, can we really expect them to grow that large around here? Um, you know, the, the South Shore of Lake Superior yeah. is really a beautiful microclimate that mm -hmm. I don't think people from mm -hmm. Duluth, a lot of people from Duluth or Northern Minnesota realize that it is really significantly warmer in the summertime and warmer in the wintertime and more snow there. So a lot of these things that maybe you and I would try here in Duluth or in this region, that might not do very well or might on a winter like we had this winter, um, might not survive. But with that snow cover, 
few degrees warmer on the south shore, things like that can grow. Okay. Well, right now, uh, we want to take a look at what we can be doing to jumpstart our gardens. Many people like to start some of their seeds indoors. I know Bob and Tom have, and many times over the years, but there's a few things that uh, you really need to know for success. Let's take a look at uh, where we want to start with starting our seeds. And I think that uh, one of the first things is, is the soil. The right. containers. Uh, that, that's going to be the starting point. Uh, the type of soil starting mix, we'll make this very clear. You don't want a potting soil because potting soils right. typically have got a fertilizer component which seedlings won't tolerate. So you want to start with, you have a number of options there, but you want to start with a, a well draining mix that's maybe not sterile but uh, nearly sterile. Mm -hmm. So that would be, and we'll talk about some of the formulas, but well drained and sterile and no fertility are the key components mm -hmm. of a starting mix rather than a growing mix. Okay. And then uh, as Bob mentioned, containers, so good uh, containers that drain well, you don't want those seeds sitting in damp, wet soil. So something But you do want it thoroughly moist when, yes. you, when you go to plant. Yeah. Um, and you want to keep it moist. Mm -hmm. And depending on the mix that you're using, you just don't want to water and let it dry down because the seeds will actually germinate. You've got a young, tender seedling that needs a steady supply of water, not wet. That's why we need good drainage, but we need to be constantly providing uh, moisture so that that seedling does not dry out. And, and, and even a spray bottle with the squeeze trigger on it is really nice, depending on how much you have that you're take, trying to keep moist, but it, just uh, giving them a spritz every, every day. So. And when we cover them, when we talk about covering them, that's something clear just in the very early stages. Yep. Clear in the early stages, not in the direct sun, so we don't superheat inside there. That's just really to get the, keep the moisture, raise the relative humidity till we get the germination process uh, started. And 15 hours a day of, of light, is that about right? Uh, depending on the seed okay. variety, but that's a good average. So. Okay. Most seed requires light, some do not, even though they're, it's penetrating down there, but uh, at least uh, three quarters of the day length. Once the seedlings light. come, then what do we do? Well, um, then, as mentioned, a little fan for air circulation. Yep. Then you have the, the potential for disease, and damping off is one of the big problems. We don't want to use any chemical fungicides, so getting some air movement through there, I think, is very important. We had a, a shot there of a, a good mix, one that I happen to recognize. Four parts peat, one part perlite, and one part vermiculite. Oh, there it is again. Yeah. Yep. You notice all these components. It's a very standard. You can get all of these components and buy them and mix it in independently. But the four parts peat is peat egg is horticultural peat moss, not the moss itself, but a milled horticultural peat, not the black junky stuff, but the brownish material that comes in the large bale. And uh, that's nearly sterile and will hold some moisture. Uh, the perlite and the vermiculite components permit good drainage, and both of those are sterile because of the way they're processed. All right, no reason we can't get planting right yeah, now. That, well, and then, and not everything. As those, <laughs> as those, <laughs> yeah, as those seedlings are starting to grow, if you mm -hmm. are growing under artificial light, raising those lights up as those plants are mm -hmm. growing. So. Okay, great, great. Excellent information. Here's some questions. Barbara from Lake Nabagamin um, wants to know, will the elderberry bush grow in this area, and will it produce berries the first year? Well, maybe not the first year. It's native to the area, so there, there isn't going to be a problem there. But they have to go into a, a more mature phase from a juvenile phase. So depending on how large it is and how much vigor you get, you probably got to plan on the second and third year for berries, I would say. Yeah, and they'll, yeah, and they're, many of that are hardy for our region, including varieties like the black lace, which has the deep burgundy foliage is, and the pinkish yeah, white yeah, flower. Yeah, that's beautiful. And mm -hmm. then they do produce berries. But she's probably going to need probably three to five years before okay. it's... Um, have you heard it's a homeopathic remedy? I've heard that it can be used. Some of the yeah. different parts of the plant, including the flowers, can be yeah. used for that. So Very cool. Lisa from Ganesan um, wants to know what to plant her blooming crab in, what kind of soil, how deep should it be planted? Oh, good questions. Uh, the crabs will tolerate a range of soils, everything from a heavier clay. Again, drainage, anything we can do to improve the drainage is, is important. but. Uh, Sand, sandy loams, or even clays. With a clay for these kinds of trees, it's going to take longer for the root system to get established, so it requires patience on your part. As far as depth goes, uh, you want to take a look at your, your uh, 
your tree seedling or yearling and, and open it up out of the pot and look for the first large flare root mm -hmm. that comes off and that needs to go beneath the soil surface but maybe an inch or so, not in real deep, and that gives you a pretty good idea of uh, the depth of the plant. And cool. probably the most common problem why people lo lose young trees that they plant or purchase is planting too deep. Uh, so making sure, as Bob mentioned, that root flare is just below the soil surface, an inch or so, um, and making sure that they're mulching around that tree to protect it into the future from mower damage and things like that, but not mulch up against the bark of the okay. tree. So. All right, Virginia from Superior says in mid-July, white powder covers all her plants and all of the beds. What could it be and what can I do about it? You know, it could be either what we call gray mold, botrytis, or more likely powdery mildew. It's something we never really saw much of before, but we're seeing more of it. Um, we really don't have good controls. If it's a major problem, there are now powdery mildew resistant varieties, and that's probably, natural resistance is probably the best course of action. It's not bad every year though, so just because you had that particular problem last year with all the moisture doesn't mean it's going to reoccur this year. Yeah. And, that, and that's a great point, looking for those varieties that are mildew resistant, whether it's some of our vining vegetables or perennials like bee balm or lilacs, which can have a big problem with it as well, looking for mildew resistant varieties as she goes into the future. So Okay, we have some suggestions on some new things to plant too nice. coming up. Uh, but one more question right now, Brett from Superior wants to know how to plant radish and turnips to get them more round instead of straight growing like carrots, is that an issue? <laughs> Well, the first thing is you've got to select the uh, globular round variety. Uh, there are a lot of these varieties that are going to be elongated, many of the Japanese varieties. So with these radishes, start with uh, Cherry Bell and Champion. They've been around for a long time. They're going to give you nice round radish, and you won't have a problem there. Okay, great. Bob, do radishes make you burp? <laughs> well, that's kind of a personal question. I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> The public wants to know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay, moving on. Um, we want to take you back now to the South Shore of Lake Superior for more from Washburn Gardeners, Pam and John Smiley. I bought about 30 boxwoods and I made a hedge like this, the predictable uh, lined up square, you know, rectangle, uh, square corner hedge and so basically, I cut off anything that didn't look like a fish. And it took me a while to grow their, their fins out. I did add boxwoods at the end so I could give them a, a better tail. So those are my kissing bass. This sofa, this was totally tongue in cheek. So I literally took these plants and five across and three or no two coming forward and then the three junipers and then tried to visualize a sofa after letting it grow for three years it's milkshake um, I knew our grandkids would like the name milkshake I thought they're really quite large or cone flowers a burgundy smoke bush and the it's done remarkably well and somebody told me well they're not zoned for this area but again being close to the lake it just it, everything I've put in just go, goes crazy new growth illuminates like that that's new growth this year I think that I'm just blessed with a really kind growing area. When you stand here in amongst the bee balm, there are more hummingbirds flying around you than you can count. What do you do when you have three pieces of beautiful curved iron? And this is what came up. A lot of flocks and then the hydrangea. Um, these are a beautiful, purple iris, but intensely purple. Um, then there's a blood red tiger lily that comes up. And I like to let things run into each other. I like it, to me it lo looks like a bouquet in the garden. These are 
coral burst crab apple. I'm going to keep them trimmed. Everything's in threes. That's why I call it my Trinity garden. It's spiritual for me too. When you look at a flower and you're seeing the beauty or a plant, for those instants, you're not thinking about anything else. It's, it's God's gift. And that's how I see it. Well, we had such a great time out there on the South Shore, and uh, we're so fortunate to be back there twice, once in the spring and then late summer yeah. when the hibiscus were in bloom. And a beautiful example of how our gardens evolve over the right. course of the season, mm -hmm. and what we saw there in May was so different than what you guys saw just a, a, a few weeks later. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. And you know, Pam got a little bit in the spiritual side of things there, hit our sensitive sides, right, Tom? Mm -hmm. That's right. But uh, I really think that uh, people don't realize it, but there's something about the gardening, you know, gardening for the body and the soul, and there's something very, very relaxing, tranquil, and beautiful about gardens. It can as be they really emerge. meditative. It really can. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that was fun. Okay, well, here's some questions for you guys. We're going to put you back to work here. Uh, Sandy <laughs> from Superior has a dwarf Korean lilac tree. The top's dying off. Shoots are growing. It's 12 years old. What do you think is going on there? Um, probably need a little more information and if Sandy could even send us a picture of what oh, it's doing. Okay. But uh, the dwarf Korean lilac, if it's the tree form, is actually the, the bush part of the, is grafted onto a stalk. And if it's died below that or above that graft, um, it may actually be reverting to the original stock of what she's hmm. seeing. So if she's seeing sprouts coming up from the base or from the stock of it and the top has died, more than likely that it has died above the graft and it's reverting back. So. And it could be a hardiness issue, certainly, because the, the uh, rootstock is obviously grafted for hardiness, typically, as well as dwarfing characteristics. But it also, in superior heavy clay soils, so moisture and drainage is always an issue there as well. Mm. So even though you have heavy soils, we don't want things to be really wet. So anything you can do in terms of moving the soil around or installing any kind of drainage tile or facility will be helpful even in a heavy clay. Okay. Uh, Becky fra wants to know if we can grow ornamental Japanese maple trees in northern Minnesota. Um, there are getting to be a few more varieties uh, that are hardy, and I grew one for about a decade. Um, however, I grew it in a container, and we're actually going to be talking about container trees, mm -hmm. uh, little smaller ones, but uh, I grew it in a container for about a decade, and every fall what I did with my Japanese maple uh, container and all is I partially buried it in my vegetable garden and then covered it with bags of leaves. And it lasted for about a decade uh, and did beautifully. Mm -hmm. Now there are getting to be a few varieties that are a little hardier, but northern Minnesota, I, I, I wouldn't invest a lot sure. in it sure. and maybe experiment with some of them first. So. Okay. Um, this is just a, a comment. I love to buy zone six or seven plants, enjoy them as an unusual annual, and compost them in the fall. Oh, so she treats them as annuals. That mm -hmm. might be a way to do it. The, the industry loves you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But, you know, if we could take just a moment, uh, people that do want to experiment, we are not zone five yet. I think this winter again demonstrated that. We're zone right. three and four. To, yeah, unless you're out in the Bayfield Peninsula where they can feel comfortable calling themselves Zone 5. But a couple things real quickly, if you want to, want to press the zones a little, you got a little zone envy like we call that. Good drainage, uh, wind protection, and if you can get planted anywhere there might be a little heat leak like through a masonry basement that's a little bit heated. Anything where you capture a little bit more heat on a southern side and near the lake. So you put all that together and there's probably one or two places in the community where you can grow some zone five stuff. <laughs> some interesting stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or okay. more interesting. More we interesting. can grow fun things and, and like you said, if, if you have some of those characteristics to, to utilize to expand your uh, plant palette, that's a good thing. There so. we go. Okay, Linda from Duluth has an eight-year-old apple tree 
thinks it might be a honey crisp, but has seen no blossoms or fruit ever. Looks fine, though, otherwise, and the deer like it. <laughs> so she says, what's going on? So maybe the when the deer like it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think the deer like all apples. <laughs> They're not discriminating. But uh, eight years is, she thinks it's a honey crisp, so we're not really sure. You know, that all depends on how it was grafted. And um, the greater the dwarfing characteristics of the rootstock, the faster it will come into maturity. If it hasn't been grafted, it's on a standard rootstock, eight years would not be unusual. So I think she still needs patience uh, with both the deer and waiting for them to blossom. But she does have to do something about deer control. Okay. Yeah. All so right. fencing it or something along sure. that line. Fencing, to there's it. an interesting word. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lisa in Duluth has some tulips bulb, tulip bulbs that have been in mixed compost, manure, um, but their hollow shells or missing. Is Could it be uh, the weather? Could it be varmints? What do you think is going yeah. on? Yeah, it could be both of those if it's uh, more likely they've yeah. rotted away over time. And really what I recommend for folks who want to enjoy tulips is every fall planting additional tulips into their tulips. Because some of these that we, the hybrids don't last a long time. So getting new varieties and new bulbs planted every fall will ensure that they have tulips to enjoy the following spring. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Tom, when you look at some of the spring flowering bulbs, there are some things like daffodils will naturalize, but tulips, we're going to have to go through this replacement cycle. Mm -hmm. Industry loves us there, too, in the yeah. Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Rose from Cloquet has a problem with tomato blight, and uh, wondering if, once you get tomato blight, are the tomatoes safe to eat? Good, good, good questions. Blight, general term probably for some of the fungal diseases, is early blight, late light, blight, and septoria. Never really a health issue on the fruit. Uh, the fruit will not keep nearly as long as it's been infected. I'll hear people say, well, I like a little blight because it hastens maturity. Well, it really damages uh, your overall yield as well as how long you can keep the fruit. But it's, it's not dangerous. Uh, there are many things in a wet year that you can, uh, you can try, but sometimes short of using fungicides, uh, they can be a challenge to grow without any, any blight at all. Okay. Good health for that plant, uh, good air drainage, separate them, uh, never water on the top, keep the plant tissue as dry as you can. Lots, in the case of tomatoes, lots of potassium, which were deficient in our soils across the region. Uh, and this will strengthen the leaf tissue and help uh, prevent the infection from a lot of the fungal spores. And, and Bob, you've done uh, looking into some of the varieties that the industry has really promoted as blight resistant and things like that. And what have you found? Well, uh, I saw some, for, uh, some catalog claims. I'm very excited about early blight resistance, put them all on trial with good controls and really found no varieties. Even those that come out of some oh. of the new breeding programs that are resistant to early blight, some are resistant to late blight, but we rarely see that in this area. So I think um, we've got to go back to real good cultural practices and if need be, the use of some labeled and approved fungicides in early June. So okay. good, good planting, good airflow, proper time of the day to water. Healthy like plants, it. healthy yeah. plants. And, because uh, there's nothing more frustrating than going to harvest those tomatoes. And Right, and <laughs> something we learned last, on. one little thing that we learned last year that may help people, stagger your planting because <laughs> we found that, that sometimes these plants in their growth phase are a little more vulnerable to disease. We saw plantings where they were planted two weeks apart and maybe it was the middle week that stood up resistant to a lot of the blight because it was a tough blight year because of the moisture and on either side it didn't work. So once again, the industry likes the fact you got to buy three, <laughs> <laughs> three plants and tomatoes and keep right on planting. So it might be something that you would consider. That's okay. the first year we've observed that, but it was very prominent. Interesting. Okay. Well, we will be back with a lot more of great gardening, including season trends and a sneak peek of our upcoming shows in April, May, and June. But right now, some very interesting conifer trees. The first part of our tour in Washburn, Pam Smiley shared her love of tamaracks. They are, um, were something that she thought was a, was a lot of fun, and there's all different kinds of them. Well, we have a look now at some unique tamaracks in bonsai form in the gardens of Dave Severson in Duluth. Part of what you'll also see is a lot of tamaracks. They are my personal favorite, partly because I tend to be thrifty. 
I've found some of them in, in ditches uh, where they've been bush hogged by cutting them off. And because they're so resilient, they, they come back. And in, in that process, they start budding down lower and create some lower branches. This would be an example of one that got hit pretty hard. It's got a lot of wire on it. I've got some guy wires. I've got just some uh, shaping movement. What I'm doing in bonsai is trying to reproduce age. Right now they've got the green foliage, but these are um, deciduous conifers, which is crazy. They turn gold in the fall, drop all their needles. When I go up north go trout fishing in late September and October, part of getting there I'll look into ditches and I'll see just this flush of gold just like they're lit up. I'll remember where that is and come back next spring and get it. So this would be an example of a forest planting. What bonsai means is tree in a pot or tree in a tray. Welcome back. We still have a lot of gardening to talk about, but we're so excited to hear the phones ring with questions and donations of support. We can't thank people well, enough. The studio is buzzing with it people is. calling. It is. Yeah, it's a lot of fun here tonight. Um, what we want to talk about right now, though, especially at this time of year, are some of the trends and ideas of things to try for the 2018 growing season. We're going to start with a look at some annuals. And uh, Tom, some of these are things that you've heard are going to be hot this year, yeah. no pun intended, with the Sun Patience. <laughs> yeah, Sun Patience, just an outstanding choice if folks are looking for something that really grows in uh, pretty much uh, deep shade to, to sunny conditions. Yeah, both conditions. And, and little problems with some of the disease uh, and funguses that we see on the, the standard varieties of impatience. So if the folks have battled that but still want to grow impatience. Resistant to downy mildew, do you yep. think? Yeah. And you know the great thing, people ask about ground covers under their evergreens where they try to grow grass. Don't grow grass, try growing some of oh, these flowers, sure. impatience. Why yeah. not? Yeah. Moss great. rose, we just saw as another uh, good choice to try. There are some new cool colors. Uh, Color Blast Watermelon Punch, I like that one, and Tangerine. And those have a little bit different leaf maybe, Tom, than the ones we're used to? Yeah, a little flatter, a little less succulent leaf than some of the moss roses that we've seen in the past, but certainly great colors, so. Mandeville, look at this one, it's gorgeous. It's a, a sun parasol apricot. Yeah, isn't that beautiful? And again, as folks want to look for things that attract uh, hummingbirds or butterflies or bees, mm. great plants for that. So. Sure. Okay, let's look at some perennials. The Baptisia American Goldfinch spreads to three feet wide, four feet high with bright yellow flowers. That's your uh, false indigo, right? Yeah, false indigo. So really, up till now, those varieties were mainly blue in the Baptisia family, but now they're really exploring some of the other colors. So. We have a lemon yellow, uh, lemon drop rather, echinate. Will somebody say that e for me? Echinacea. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's okay. <laughs> like the variety though. Good choice. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> lemon drop is too hard. Uh, no, <laughs> lemon drop is pretty easy for me to say. Thank you. Um, lemon yellow double flowers on sturdy stalks. That's that's beautiful. As is this hibiscus. Wow. Mars Madness deep red flower blooms on four foot tall stems July through September. Yeah and, and again we talked about that with Pam's garden and some of the varieties that she has. Folks can look for these and even if they don't grow for us as perennials they will put on that kind of size as an annual each sure. year. So you can grow this um, if it, if it is, doesn't survive for you as a perennial it is an outstanding annual. So couple lilies to talk about. Yeah, the eyeliner came out just a couple of years ago. Beautiful, fragrant flowers that are just perfect on the stock. You can see the, 
why it's called the eyeliner with the edging around the, the uh, petals there. And so. this pink one is gorgeous too. Yeah, uh, outstanding size, probably eight inches across flowers. Sunny Bonaire Lily, look for that too. So, Couple peonies, do you say, how do you say it? Ito. Ito. The Mikasa, uh, wow, I love those colors in yeah. that orange, and it fades to yellow. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, those are the varieties that are been developed. They're intersectional, so they're a cross between a tree peony and a herbaceous peony, but beautiful, large flowers. This Again, is an intersectional, too, the Singing yep. in the Rain. Love the name of that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tom, you might comment, they're not going to be inexpensive, but they, they can last a long, long time if planted correctly and not too deep, so they flower. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Peonies, love them. Uh, and then the sedum called yeah. night embers. Night embers, really a, a very upright sedum. Folks have struggled if they've gotten some of the other varieties that in a heavy rain or, or winds as they're really mature and have toppled over. This one's really sold for that beautiful deep burgundy foliage and it's very rigid stock. So. One more shrub that we know you're really excited about, yeah. Tom. This is a lilac and um, uh, it's a rebloomer. Yeah, this is actually a tree. Tree rather than form. a shrub, okay. or rather than a perennial, it's a it's an ornamental tree. We get about eight feet tall. Um, it's a member of the bloomerang lilacs, so it's the common lilac, uh, but really in a tree form. And the interesting thing about this is they're uh, beautiful <coughs> flowers, and it blooms twice for us. Oh. So it will bloom in the spring. How and great then is again that to have your lilac so bloom twice? Huh? I know. <laughs> and those beautiful fragrant flowers, little to no, to no disease or insect problems. Nice. And, and the deer, for the most part, leave them alone too. What? <laughs> Sounds like the perfect plant. Yeah, that's what I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The little asterisk, for the most part. For the most <laughs> part, <laughs> yeah. Right. All right. Uh, Mary Lou we say from, that with everything. Yes, we do. Sorry. We, we have some questions we're going to get to now. Uh, Mary Lou from Hibbing wonders, what's the difference between husk tomatoes and ground cherries? The ones I ate as a child were very sweet, and we called them husk tomatoes. Guess what? Uh, same plant, lots of different names, right? Okay. Husk <laughs> tomatoes, ground cherries, husk cherries, and they are kind of fun. And if you let them mature, they can be nice and sweet, otherwise a little tart, right, Tom? Yep. And uh, I think uh, maybe something more people should try. I remember from my childhood as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we've got to try a few yeah. more of those. High in beta carotene, a uh, member of the same family as the tomatoes, so they're nightshade family plants, so very similar. Cool. All right, um, Bob, you don't have to answer about the burping, but how do you keep <laughs> radishes from getting wormy in the summer? Oh, there is a challenge because. Uh, <laughs> I cannot even recommend a labeled fungicide for that use. So you're going to really, you can cover with a very light grade remay to keep the flies out. Fly comes, merges from the soil, comes and attacks the plant as the, as the root is forming up and uh, riddles the plant, uh, the root itself. So try uh, covering with a light fabric remay polyester and that will help in that particular issue. And keep moving them. Mm -hmm. Rotation, 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 sure. just because these populations get established in one area in the soil. Okay, all right. Uh, John from Duluth wants to know about neonicotinoids. Um, is there a widespread use of them in greenhouses? Is there an alternative chemical for bee protection? Tom, I know you've done a little research on this. Yeah, and and. <laughs> Not without promoting our greenhouse again, but uh, we have taken a very uh, firm position on not using any neonicotinoids mm -hmm. on any of our plants. A lot of greenhouse. people have now. Yeah, and I know the greenhouse folks in uh, Carleton also have taken that position. Boyd, Marinelle mm -hmm. up in uh, Rice Creek mm -hmm. uh, Gardens up along Rice Lake Ro or Rice Lake Gardens uh, have also taken that position. So there's lots of good folks, local growing folks who uh, see this as important and, and it's really much, uh, very much of a focus for them. So. And at least our local industry, and that's what I really like, have been very responsive to the needs from the public. Can we mention, now that everybody knows how to say the word neonix or neonicotinoids, <laughs> uh, remember again that it's basically all insecticides when anything's in bloom. So you have to be careful of everything. If you elect to use an insecticide evening hours when there are no pollinators out or on really heavy overcast days to minimize any possible pressure. So it's not just the neonics, but as homeowners, we need to avoid or carefully use all pesticides. Okay, all right, great great point to, to continue to make as we talk about this. Um, Ellen in Duluth wants to know, can I trim my, service, my young serviceberry tree to a shrub form? Sure, 
Yeah, I mean, if she wants to, if she cuts it back, it's going to sprout from the base. So uh, it, I'm not sure why she'd want to, though. Hmm. Um, okay. Really, th there are two different ways you can grow it as a, as, a sh as a small ornamental tree. And really, it's just been pruned down to the one major stock or, or uh, trunk on it. Sure. Um, but it can also be grown as a shrub. So, mm -hmm. and you know, this is a June Barrier, Amelanchier, Saskatoon's got lots, lots of names. Oh, just, those are all the same. Just like the okay. Husk Cherry, Husk Tomato, all one and the same. Different cultivars, but in pruning, do you think uh, starting early and doing it regularly if you want to keep it more compact? Otherwise, if you just lop the top off and there's a lot of woody material, it's really not going to bush out at the base like some people might hope. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Start early if you want to, and keep pruning if you plan on that. All right. Sounds good. Okay, well, Bob Olin is our go-to guy when we talk about what's trending in vegetables, and we've got a few ideas for that. And, and Bob, I think uh, what's interesting is that we're still seeing people looking for healthier options with the deeper pigments, right? We really are. Uh, pigments are really important, even in a group like the cabbage family, cabbage, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, uh, cauliflower, kohlrabi this year as well, all part of these brassicas, these uh, cabbage group, they contain a big group of chemicals that contain sulfur, sulforaline is one of them that actually have been documented to prevent cancer, one of the first antioxidants for that purpose. But even here, we're seeing some colors being introduced, the deep uh, purple colors, uh, just as antioxidants uh, because the public is now aware. And it adds color at the same time it adds uh, a managed and kind of balanced good nutrition. So we're seeing that in lots of different uh, families, not just the cabbages, but in the tomatoes as well. Now here's a prudent purple that on my screen isn't quite purple yet. Maybe it's a little young. <laughs> you know, the, <laughs> when I looked this up, they said it's not a, it's not really that purple, but yours have been. And they won't get more purple than, than this, certainly. Okay, they, and, so maybe uh, these aren't right. Maybe not quite <laughs> as ripe, but again, they're, they're looking for the same compounds, and there are any number of these anthocyanins that are in. There's a huge series out there called the Indigo series, Indigo Kumquat, uh, and uh, Indigo Apple is another one, and these, you can see that more definite uh, purple, but that is the anthocyanin, same antioxidant that's in blueberries, and the breeders are trying to incorporate that. Now that people can pronounce anthocyanin, they want to get it in everything. <laughs> and here's a, here's a good one. We don't have any trouble pronouncing health kick. This yeah. is one of the uh, this is one of the lycopene rich tomatoes, and people should remember again, tomatoes actually when you cook and process, we even intensify the lycopene, which again is one of the antioxidants. So there's a lot of hocus pocus in nutrition, but. Uh, Lycopene is one of the antioxidants, does prevent uh, some types of cancer, particularly prostate cancer. So I think uh, a better balanced diet, Health Kick is one of the varieties of tomato that we can mature. Right. I know the folks up at Cherry Greenhouse have been successful as well. So it's a good variety, great name, and it will mature on the vine in this area. Try that Health Kick, what the yeah. heck? <laughs> All right. And then if I might say, I've got a nutrient enriched antioxidant colleague today in this beautiful <laughs> lycopene enriched shirt that he has. <laughs> That's why he's so youthful. To yeah, me. I do try to be healthy. There right? you go. <laughs> okay, there's another Bob that we want to recognize tonight. He's our longtime phone volunteer and gardener, Bob Nordstrom, who had a birthday recently. Bob's been with us um, how many years helping uh, on the phones? He did not miss a show for 14 years. 14 years 14 he years. came in and helped Bob and I phone. each missed one. Yes, and we did. He and did Bob Nordstrom didn't. Did not. Right. <laughs> yeah. And that's because look at how healthy, look at the celery look at the vegetables and tomatoes. He's eating. Yeah. Lovely morning drink. Did he grow <laughs> those tomatoes? He's a great gardener. Yeah. Yeah. And did he grow those vegetables? Yeah. And see how and vegetables the, just bring a smile pickle, to your face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was much happier after he consumed his vegetables <laughs> than before. We love we love you, Bob. We hope you're listening in. Happy he birthday is. to Bob. Okay. Um, now we want to take a look at what's to come this spring and summer on Great Gardening. This season on Great Gardening, we take you to a garden in cotton where dozens of different dahlias are planted each year for late summer enjoyment. Just outside of Duluth, a straw bale gardener offers an overview of lessons learned from growing vegetables in his above ground environment over the last few years. A local scholar of the art of bonsai shares his insights and expertise in the care of the tiny trees and plantings that are grown in containers. 
We'll see what food is being grown nearby for area restaurants and retreats. And we'll take you on a tour to home gardens across the region, including some beautiful lakeside landscapes. Plus, as always, a bushel basket of expert advice for you each week from Tom and Bob on the 2018 regular season of great gardening starting April 5th. A lot to come April, May, and June. Yeah, so, can't you guys wait. ready? Can't wait. Yeah. Okay, I'm good. looking forward to what you're going to be featuring. Yeah, thanks. Some fun thanks. stuff. Yeah. Yeah, we're Should always be intrigued. You'll let us know before we... <laughs> <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe I will, or maybe I'll just throw it at you, like, okay. this, like this question. Okay. Okay, this one's from Ely, and I have a beta grapevine. Mm. Um, is it better to move it in the spring or in the fall? I'd say in the spring. Okay. And she's got beta, so if you got to go grapes, they all have a cross with our native river grape. Beta, Valiant, Bluebell. And each came uh, Valiant, which is probably the hardiest and a real popular because it's very prolific. Came out of South Dakota. Beta came out of the University of Minnesota production uh, trials, and uh, Bluebell came out of Wisconsin. So we don't discriminate. So the Midwest, Midwest, is these well real hardy grapes, and they all have some heritage back to our native river grape. And and certainly, uh, spring is also a great time if she's thinking about uh, taking some cuttings and rooting those cuttings from that as well. So. And you know, we always get the question on these natives: you can prune them back pretty extensively in the early part of the year. That was the, the next question I had from Fred, no and it said, um, I have <laughs> wild grapes, when do I prune them and how much do I prune them? Which is kind of answered, early spring and okay. uh, pretty pretty aggressively. They, really, really. Because yeah, they have that them. good uh, root system from being native in the area. You yeah. can take them down to five, six feet if they'd like to. So. Okay, all right. Love those grapes. Okay, Tom from Duluth has a pear tree. It's five years old, self-pollinator, the blossoms turn black and fall off. What can I do? What's going on here? Ooh, th th this is a fungal issue with that with that plant tissue. And um, he's just going to have to wait perhaps for a better year. If he doesn't want to use fungicides, there are some fungicides that are labeled, which uh, different than insecticides. We never play, apply anything near bloom with an insecticide, but some of the fungicides he'd want to go very early at bud break and be very careful about it. But uh, that's probably the only solution that he's mm. going to have. Some years are worse than others, and, and you just have to be patient. Some years you're not going to treat or apply, and obviously if you lose the blossoms, you're going to lose the fruit. But sometimes it's worth, rather than trying to trying to use some kind of a fungicide or insect or a pesticide on it. And them. maybe two applications of that. It doesn't have to do it all season or anything okay. like that. So. You've grown pear trees. Yep. Yep. And have they been successful? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, and there's a beautiful pair of a friend of mine down on London Road that the, the trunk of the tree is no probably kidding. that big around and thousands of pears on it. They're not the big uh, type that we're used no. to, the Bartlett yeah. in the grocery store. They're probably half to two-thirds that size, but, but great eating um, mm -hmm. and also using for jams and things like that. So Great Wonderful. flavors. I think an underutilized uh, tree fruit species, so uh, golden spice or any number of, of good varieties that are hardy for this area. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, Mary in Duluth has tried to grow a, I'm going to spell it, D-E-U-T-Z-I-A shrub. Dutzia? I guess so. Yeah. Do you know what it is? Yeah. Well, um, with little success. Any yeah. advice on how to grow it? Um, or what is it? Tell yeah. us what it is. Well, it's, <laughs> it's a, it, I mean, it's a shrub and it, it does not really do well. Some folks have, have tried to sell it up here into, into our climate but really it's a northern Minnesota variety that does much better there. It has beautiful flowers, can be very interesting. Most of the time though, our winters are just a little too harsh for it. Okay. Um, Jim is wondering, how deep should I set a barrier or edging around my flower bed to keep the lawn grass out? Oh, that is a good question. Lawn grass, depending on the type of grass, isn't always as aggressive as quack grass, but our bluegrass has these rhizomes, and I would say the lighter the soil, the sandier the soil, the deeper the barrier has to go. Heavy clay, we could get down three inches, four inches a sand, because they'll work their way through that, I would say uh, six to eight inches. Okay, good. And a good, tough poly barrier is probably the best uh, best choice for that. Right. Always, when you're buying barriers, don't go for the cheap stuff, because they just don't last one season, and they heave. Uh, buy a good commercial grade, even if you have to go to a commercial landscaper and say, could I buy some of the product that you're accessing? I'm willing to pay a little bit more, but a quality edging your time is really worth something putting it in. So mm -hmm. good quality, durable poly edging. Okay. 
Um, we have a calendar item to talk about. There's a spring garden extravaganza coming up. Bob, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, we're going to have lots of fun. This is April 14th, and we are following two tracks, one on edibles, the other on, on ornamentals. It's titled uh, Gardening for the Body and the Soul, and it's going to feature Dr. David Zelak, who used to be with the University of Minnesota, and our Wisconsin viewers may be glad to know that he now works in the Wisconsin system. <laughs> <laughs> River Falls is a good friend of mine. He's been successful with a number of introductions, again, on the sustainable shrub roses. He's going to be talking about uh, some cutting-edge rose material for this area and cutting-edge landscape plants. And he's going to do a segment on uh, grafting your own fruit trees. We're actually sourcing some of the cyan and root material there as well. There's but, the number, there's the website, and tell us um, about Julie Overham. We are so pleased because this is yeah, her rose. This Isn't is a rose gorgeous. called uh, Cherry Frost. Uh, she has spent the last 20 years selecting for this disease-resistant rose. She told me when she switched careers, became a rose breeder midlife, that her only goal in the rest of her life was one introduction. She's getting it this year. She will be talking about rose propagation at the spring extravaganza. And I hope she isn't listening because this is going to be a big secret. So we won't tell anybody, but we're going to celebrate her success on that day as well. <laughs> Don't we, tell her. I love visiting I love surprise and, and seeing all, all, all her um, work. And she has several other good introductions coming cool. along. And uh, she unfortunately stuff. was one of the St. Louis County Master Gardens. She went to Wisconsin as well. What are you doing over there in Wisconsin? <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and David that you mentioned has, has a lot of roses coming out as well, including yes. above and beyond. Beautiful rose, which sustainable. Is a beautiful, Excellent. Yeah, and it's a climber, so folks that are looking for maybe a little different oh, than the William Baffin. I can't wait Baffin, to try some of those. Uh, outstanding climber. So. Big part of the Earth Kind series, which the whole objective is hardy, pest resistant, minimal use of any type of an organic or synthetic uh, pesticide. Sounds like we have to have a, have a show about roses again. We so do. we will. We do. Okay. Well, as always, we want to encourage you to go to our website for updates, our season schedule, and special events. Plus, you can find all the past episodes of this program there at wdse.org slash gardening. Um, real quickly, do you have any goals you've set for yourself this garden season? Um, to survive it. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. To be here next year. Yeah. <laughs> year 17. My goal always is to plant a little less and a little higher quality, and I always fail. <laughs> <laughs> well, and keep trying. And enjoy it. And I mean, enjoy it. Really, enjoy right. the garden. A uh, huge thank you to all the people behind the scenes and in the community who helped make this show possible. Bob, Tom, you guys are the best. We couldn't do this show without you. Thank you so much. And let's thank our friends at PBS for providing this beautiful venue and for all of our supporters who really make this possible. Absolutely. And, and folks, don't forget to call and, and continue to support PBS. The phones are still open. Uh, the volunteers from St. Louis County Master Gardeners are there standing by. Big thank you to them, to all of you who called in with questions and support. Um, you still have a chance again to do that. So please stay tuned to find out more about that and our popular uh, bus garden tours. And we just want to thank you again from all of us here at Great Gardening and we will see you back here in April. Bye. <laughs>